going to start this off with a very depressing quote, especially if you're a Muslim. It's not an exaggeration to say that Islam is now living through its proverbial dark ages. Those are the words of Professor Al-Fadl from UCLA Law. He's been trying to tell the Muslims and his audience specifically that if we don't stop with our apologetics and excuses and denial and start to get our house in order soon, we might not make it out of this dark age. Now, even though I respectfully disagree with Professor Al-Fadl's proposed solutions, on this statement of the problem, we completely agree. A few years ago, me and a friend of mine were wondering if this may just be the worst time for Muslims ever, in our 1400-year history. This was around when ISIS was just coming up in Iraq, and back in our native country of Pakistan, every other week there was a huge bomb blast by the TTP killing masses of people. And on top of all of that, every now and then there would be some fanatic ISIS type dude who would just randomly shoot up a place in Europe or North America. And of course, as a result, every month or so there was some imperial atheist prophet like Sam Harris who would just give a lecture on how crazy Muslims are and how insane Islam is and is the most militant religion ever. Now, I realize that the period of colonialism was much worse than our current era, but obviously this is still pretty bad for Muslims. Mainly because all of our failures are on the front page all over the world, all the time. By some accounts, our dark age began 500 years ago, so we've been in it for a long time now. And there is a growing sense right now that the Islamic civilization has reached a critical stage. Remember that 500 years is all the Western civilization got too. That's how long its own dark age lasted, which these days is more politely referred to as the early Middle Ages. Up till now, we've tried a few solutions to get out of this dark age, but none of them have worked. First, we tried secularization, trying to half-heartedly ape and copy the West. Well, thank God that failed, and right quick. Then we entered our current fanatical era with the fundamentalist upswing. And because of this, we have all sorts of insanity. Mainly because our core fundamentals have been so corrupted by the sectarian traditionalists over time. The only good thing as far as I can see is that at least now we've reached a point where we are finally starting to ask some real questions. Questions that neither the seculars nor the traditionalists have any answers for. Here's a few fun examples you can try at home. Try asking the traditionalists how they reconcile the fact that many of the laws they want to implement outrightly contradict the Quran. On the other hand, you can ask the seculars how they reconcile the fact that it is impossible to implement the Quran in its totality without state power. And then you can turn back to the traditionalists and ask why they cling on to these infinite sectarian divisions, even though sects are explicitly forbidden by the Quran. In fact, they're so forbidden that the Quran told the Prophet to stay away from anyone who splits off into a sect. And yet today, they go as far as to kill each other over these insane sectarian divisions. And getting back to the seculars, if they don't want to figure out a way to implement Quranic axioms constitutionally in their own societies, which is a requirement for Muslims, then why not just abandon Islam altogether? Why keep up the superficial pretense? Just get it over with. I can go on just listing these questions for a while, but to be polite to the listener, I'll stop with the list here. The point is that it's good that these questions are being asked by many Muslims. However, the problem is that they still aren't being asked often enough or loudly enough. And the main question is, why? Why aren't Muslims thinking out of the box? Why are we so dogmatic? Were we always like this, or is this something new, particular to this dark age that we're in? Well, the reason why most Muslims avoid asking such questions is because of a deep anti-intellectualism that has seeped into our cultures. And how did that happen? Well, I think there's two main reasons for this, and one of them is historical, and the other is very present and immediate. It's happening right now. The historical one is, long story short, there are certain scholarly movements in our history which made catastrophic errors of judgment in their models for deriving the laws for Muslims. That reason we're going to deal with on another day. That's a huge topic. Uh, hopefully we will deal with it in detail in the future. This episode is about the other reason which is far more immediate. And we need to deal with this one immediately because until we correct this one, we're not even going to have the confidence to ask the right questions nor analyze the answers we are given. So let me try and state this problem. The vast majority of the scientific and philosophic academic community today is atheistic, as we all know. 
And the most vocal atheist prophets today have a special dislike for Islam. They really hate it. And they use a sort of pseudo-rationalism to argue against God generally, but Islam specifically, all the time. The result of this is that a significant portion of Muslims actually end up becoming suspicious of the human intellect, even their own intellect, and they retreat into ignorance as a sort of rebellion, a knee-jerk reaction. So the anti-intellect attitudes that began in the distant past became hardened during colonialism, and then further hardened because of the secularization attempts. And now you have atheists that look down on Muslims and Islam because they see Islam as the worst of all religions and Muslims as the most anti-rational barbarians. The result is this feedback loop and the cycle needs to be broken immediately. And what's definitely not helping is uh, the nihilistic, postmodernistic attitudes in Western universities in which a lot of Muslim academics today who are studying abroad or who live abroad are growing up in. And it's just adding to the confusion and we need to put um, a break on this phenomena. It wouldn't be the first time that Western philosophy had a deep effect on Muslim intellectuals who were studying in the West and then they brought that stuff back to Muslim societies and just wrecked havoc everywhere. It happened all over the place in the 60s and 70s, actually. But anyways, the first step to breaking the cycle is to realize that modern science itself, which the atheists and Western civilization in general is using against us, was actually created by the Muslims and specifically created to study God's universe. So basically, modern science is an Islamic tool. The reason most people don't know this is because most of the history books which deal with the history of science have been compiled in a very biased way by Western historians. Even most Muslims don't know the details of how modern science came about. The reason Western historians have done this is mostly to claim ownership of modern science and those same misconceptions feed into this atheistic paradigm which is a very shaky house of cards. So first, we will correct the historical narrative of science, which will then change the context of modern science completely. And then secondly, we will expose the idea that science somehow contradicts God, because it does not. In fact, as we will show, the God solution to the real questions about the existence of the universe is on equal footing with the atheistic explanations. Consider what I just said as the thesis of this series of episodes. Overall, the series is structured like an essay, and like an essay, we will use only scholarly and highly credible sources to build our argument. At the beginning of each section, I'll list my sources and you can verify their credibility yourself. To begin with, we will start with the Greeks and see whether the mainstream narrative that Greek natural philosophy is the father of science has any truth to it or not. Then we will discuss the birth of modern science in Muslim lands and show how and why modern science was born. Then we'll turn to Renaissance Europe and see how they started the conflict between science and God, which is specifically a European thing. We're mostly going to focus on the Copernican Revolution in this period, but we're also going to briefly touch on Darwin and natural selection. And finally, we're going to move on to our present day world and discuss the case of modern mathematics and physics. We're going to break up this series of episodes into four parts, and the format is going to be solo sections like this one with me going through the research, interlace that with discussion sections with two of my friends, Nabil and Yasser. We're going to rely on Yasser a lot for the technical expertise here because he's a PhD student at UFT in the field of quantum chemistry. Now, one more thing before we begin with the research. Let me first deal with the extremely cynical Muslims who think that we have already lost the game and that the West is so far ahead that at this point, there is just no catching up to them. For this set of people, here's a few anecdotes from the Europeans themselves to give an indication of how much the tables can turn in the grand scheme of history. The following words were written by a very pissed off Christian scholar a thousand years ago, who lived in Spain at a time when the Muslims were in charge. Quote, the Christians love to read the poems and romances of the Arabs. They study Arab theologians and philosophers, not to refute them, but to form a correct and elegant Arabic. Where is the layman who now reads the Latin commentaries on the Holy Scriptures, or who studies the Gospels, prophets, or apostles? Alas, all talented young Christians 
read and study with enthusiasm the Arab books. They gather immense libraries at great expense. They despise the Christian literature as unworthy of attention. They have forgotten their own language. For every Christian who can write a letter in Latin to a friend, there are a thousand Christians who can express themselves in Arabic with elegance and write better poems in this language than the Arabs themselves. End quote. This guy, by the way, thought that Muhammad was a precursor to the biblical antichrist. So you can imagine how annoyed he was when he saw his Christian brothers and sisters adopting the ways of what he considered to be Satan's followers, basically. His name was Paul Alvarez. People like Alvarez actually had a name for these Christians who they called Mazarabs, which originally meant wannabe Arabs. It's actually surreal. It's, it's like a Twilight Zone episode that this actually happened. Seriously, when I found this quote, I was blown away. It's almost like a mirror image of myself a thousand years ago. I mean, I hope I'm not as crazy as this guy was, nor as like bitter. I, I hope I'm not. But there, there's certain things in, in what he wrote. I'm just like, wow, like, seriously, <laughs> there's a guy a thousand years ago thinking kind of like how I'm thinking today, but on the exact opposite end of the spectrum. Mind blown. Anyways. Not all Western scholars during this era had a chip on their shoulder. Some were actually very keen to learn what they could from the Muslims without griping about it. People like Petrus Alfonsi, who basically studied at a high school level in Muslim Spain, but then when he went to England, he immediately became one of the greatest Western scholars of the era because even a high school level education under the Muslims was greater than anything the West had, even at their highest levels at that time. Another was Adelard of Bath, who left France to go to the Middle East, and he called the Muslims as intellectual masters, because he said the Muslims used reason as their guide instead of blindly following ancient authoritative dogmas. Notice how the situation today is exactly inverted. And yet another scholar, Daniel of Morley, left England and first went to Paris and found the same problem as Adelard that the scholars there simply followed whatever the orthodoxy was cemented by the ancients there, instead of using any critical thinking. He was so disgusted that he called these scholars in Paris beasts, and then went to Toledo to study the, quote, doctrine of the Arabs, who he called the wisest philosophers of the world. And there was also a pope, believe it or not, Sylvester II, he tried to teach his fellow Europeans the mathematical techniques invented by the Muslims, and because of this, they started making up crazy conspiracies, like they said that the math he was trying to teach the Christians there was dangerous Saracen magic. All of this is to show how dominant the Muslims used to be at that time, which is something hard to even imagine today. But we need to keep that in mind so that we don't fall into the Fukuyama trap, as I call it. That's the guy who, after the Cold War, said that we have reached the end of history, and he was soon proven very wrong. And that is already becoming very obvious to everyone, including Western intellectuals who are beginning to see the inflection point of the curve for their own civilization, heading downwards and fast. Just compare today to where the West used to be before the world wars, in terms of relative power with the rest of the world. And some intellectuals in the West are actually themselves hoping for a speedy end to Western dominance because they can see the damage done, not just to the people all over the world, but to the planet's ecosystem itself, all due to the economic principles that the West has enforced globally with extreme brutality. Anyway, so that's my motivation for starting this podcast on this particular note. And I asked both Yasser and Nabil about theirs too. And we will end this introduction section with a clip of that discussion. Yeah, I'll illustrate uh, my motivation for doing this by conversation I had with my sister when I told her I was recording this uh, uh, podcast. And she asked me what uh, the podcast was about. When I told her that it's about God and science... Uh, she was, she seemed alarmed and she said, can you do that? Like, uh, is it, <laughs> yeah, she said basically something to the effect that that's going to be tough because you see these ideas, because they're considered so challenging, we don't even discuss them in our gatherings because what if you ask a question that, uh, that we don't have the answer to? You know, so I don't think uh, these are brought up in uh, polite company. 
Yeah, for me, it's God and science and the same topic is taboo in today's society. If you bring that up, you're going to be ostracized by um, the social justice warriors. Either you'll be categorized as a deviant or you have to be docile and follow their agenda or narrative. Would you say that that's becoming more, that's increasingly becoming more prevalent even in um, our society in Pakistan back home? Yeah, I think so, for sure. I think uh, there, there's a rise in growth in it. And uh, specifically, the what's it called? Um, the liberal class, yeah. the intellectuals of our society, they believe that if you have, if you narrate God in terms of science, you are other like in a middle ages uh, society and you have mindset of a barbarian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they are the ones who are, the ones who are advancing and yeah. who will be the critical part of the society. They will be bringing in the value and how they show like when a person is religious, he's a nut job and an atheist is a more reasoned mind individual. No, that's true here. Yeah. But in Pakistan. But the thing is, if you, you have to think of it in this manner, that the intellectuals that I'm talking about in yeah. Pakistan. Oh, they're used. Oh, they, they follow the media. Right. Here, right? Yeah. Like, so. you know, they, they follow it religiously. Right. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Would you guys think that uh, there's a sense that Islam and science are somehow polar opposites? Is that the sense that you get from uh, media generally in our societies too? Or is that still... Not just Islam and science, but uh, religion and science. And uh, yeah, in our culture, uh, while... So I would say there are two separate narratives being pushed. The one from these uh, liberal elites uh, would like you to believe that science has all the answers. Religion is either obsolete or relevant only to matters relating to our personal ways of worshipping God or spirituality. and Just rituals. Just rituals. Just, yeah, rituals just ritual, and, absolutely. Yeah. And so that's, the, that's one narrative on one extreme. And on the other extreme, you have the narrative of people who are perhaps uh, suggesting that religion, Islam for that uh, matter... Uh, already came up with these scientific theories 1400 years ago. A lot of uh, Muslims have unfortunately used this as a crutch, you know, mm. and uh, this has led to anti-scientific uh, mindset. I had a, I had a friend who uh, was a doctor now. Mm -hmm. He said that when he was studying biology in Pakistan mm -hmm. before he moved to Canada, he, his uh, biology teacher, when he, they reached the chapter on evolution, he literally prefaced the entire um, topic by saying, obviously we know this is uh, bullshit, but mm -hmm. you know, we have to study it, so we'll just quick, quickly read it and just kind of skip over it. And that's the, that's a teacher in a biology class in Pakistan. That's in that's, medical school. No, no, no. He became a doctor here. Oh, okay. But while he was in Pakistan, he said this. So for uh, the teacher was saying this is fiction. So mm -hmm. move forward. <laughs> and the funny thing is, he actually believed them. So he doesn't believe in evolution. He's a doctor. Uh -huh. He's a doc. He's a practicing doctor today mm -hmm. who does not believe in evolution. So mm -hmm. that's uh, that's uh, the extent of the problem that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So given the prevalence of these uh, lack of confidence amongst the general Muslim population, the anti-scientific mindset that we are experiencing, the relegation of religion to basic personal private sphere absolutely so what i hope to achieve by doing this podcast uh, in our small way is that uh, people find uh, that when we go over the history of where we are why we are here how we got there that they see that this is not only not inevitable that in fact there is nothing they that they need to be ashamed of or that they can boldly and confidently advocate their position by understanding its relationship to our understanding of the universe and how the two complement each other. <laughs>